Thank you for downloading our podcast. The prophet Hosea receives a strange command from God. The Lord tells him to take a woman of the night to keep it clean. He is to marry a woman who does not protect the marriage bed. And he is to build a house with this unfaithful woman. How can the Lord order a prophet to do something contrary to what God has revealed in other places in his word? What is the purpose of this book? Overall, what is a prophet Hosea teaching us? Well, as we look at chapter 14, we finish up our study in the prophet Hosea. As we know, this is a prophet who's called to take an unfaithful wife. And as he took this unfaithful wife, she played the role of Israel. And it's a rather depressing prophecy if you really go through it and you go all the way up to verse four, chapter 14. There's certainly some things we've drawn as implications of hope. But it's chapter 14 where we really find the grace of God presented to us with a call for us to turn from our foolishness and a call for us and an assurance to turn to the Lord. We think about what Israel has done. We wouldn't expect chapter 14 to offer any hope. There's been a lot of heinous sin, a lot of immorality that was just blatantly celebrated, a lot of attempts to manipulate the hand of God. And when you read of what God's people have done, you recognize that this could be us. We can struggle with these same sorts of things. And so when we hear this reality of what the Lord is doing, and as we go through also Second Peter and we think about how Peter has exhorted the saints and how there's temptations in the wilderness, and we think about how we ourselves can fall and stumble, we might wonder, why is it that God doesn't wipe his people off the face of the earth? Why has the Lord even promised to heal them? We're not worthy of healing. We're not worthy of healing. We're not worthy of his affection or his love for us. But yet chapter 14 becomes almost overwhelming when you hear of what God's people have done. So as we look at this, we'll see first called to turn with the invitation to repent. Secondly, conferring life, the center wonderful promise that God gives. And lastly, continual conforming. So let's begin then as we look at verses 1 through 3. There's a call to turn. And I want to rehash some of the things that Israel has done. Remember as Ephraim has been uh, exhorted and, and played out, where there's been a play on Ephraim and, and Isaiah's, or um, Israel, when you look at Hosea and his prophecy, there, there's a lot of puns that go on. Like you think of of Gomer, the the woman who completes, you you think that uh, she would be one who would complete Israel. But the reality is the opposite, almost brings Israel to literal completion, uh, ending, finishing, done. You think of Israel, Ephraim, northern kingdom, 200 years of idolatry since the beginning of their history. 200 years. And then being bold enough to think, well, you know, God's going to do whatever God's going to do. Obviously, he's pleased with us. Hosea has made references that Israel offers sacrifices, trying to manipulate and lead God around like some pagan god of her own imagination. Israel engaged in blatant immorality. I mean, there's so many things going on that when you hear of the people of God, you would think that Hosea would want to be stricken from our canon. That the Jewish people would not want this getting out. Because it does not make the Lord's people look good. We think of the children that Gomer bore to Hosea. Remember Jezreel. The child that was born to him. Right? It's a child where the name means scatter. Now this too is a pun. Israel is to be scattered in Canaan to build heaven on earth. And so they're scattered about the Holy Land. 
but this name becomes a threat. Instead of being a farmer beginning the season with the hope of scattering seed in the field and the joy, the optimism that maybe we're going to have a profitable year this year and God's with us, right? That's, that's the hope you would have. Then it doesn't end that way. It ends with Israel scattered among the nations. We have the second one, the second child that's born. She bore a daughter. And as she bears a daughter, her name is to be Lo Rumach, which means no mercy. Now, we've noted in the text that it doesn't say bore to him. So the implication is this is a daughter. He doesn't know who the father is. She doesn't know who the father is. This is bad. And so there's no mercy shown to the people of God. She bears him a son, or she bears a son, not to him. Again, the same scenario as the daughter. And this child's name is Loami, not my people. So when you hear these children, and Hosea adopting these children, naming these children, we said there's a little bit of an optimism there, isn't it? Because even though these children are born by implication immorality, at least the last two, that these children are still claimed by Hosea. He doesn't send them off. And so when we turn to chapter 14, this is where we have a glorious call. Where the Lord turns to Israel and says, return, O Israel. He doesn't say, O Ephraim. He says, O Israel. He doesn't say, O Judah. So this call to return for Israel, we we think of Hosea having this precedent of puns throughout uh, his prophecy. So Israel, the people who wrestle, God wrestles with him. Where does Jacob find his hope? In clinging to the Lord. And there the Lord takes a child who is called heel grabber, supplanter, manipulator, and changes the child's name to Israel. Claiming Jacob officially, visibly before Jacob, you are my son. Naming him the one who wrestles. This tells us what God wants. He wants a wrestling people. Now we've said this isn't that God wants a cantankerous people or always trying to buck against him, trying to, to push him away. But if people like what Paul says to Timothy, fight the good fight, right? Continually wrestling to conform to God, wrestling to, to walk more consistently with the Lord, understanding that life is found in clinging to our Redeemer and walking in the life-giving spirit of Christ. And so they are called to turn, to return. And why are they struggling? Well, they have stumbled because of their own iniquity. And this is an important point where the Lord's saying, don't turn to me and say, I'm the one who has failed you. Don't turn to me and blame me and say, it's I'm the one who has done this. The Lord's saying, you rushed into your sin. You wanted your sin. I gave you what you wanted. We we rehashed the whole history of the king that the Lord recalls, right? Israel says, we want a king like the other nations. The Lord says, fine. I'm going to give you a king. I'll make this concession. It's not going to end well, but here's your king. Have him. And we find it doesn't end well. And so the Lord's saying, you've stumbled and tripped because of your own doing." You wanted to sin, and I let you sin. But the Lord says, this is what I'm calling you to do. To recognize, like David in Psalm 51, against you and you only have I sinned. Turn to me, return to me. Hear the call of repentance and turning unto the Lord. Renounce your idolatry, right? Because they're no longer going to look at the work of their hands and say, my God, this isn't just trusting in the flesh, but what have we seen in Hosea? The building of the gods with their own hands, right? Hosea is laying out the absolute absurdity of idolatry. Not only figuring out what we want to live for in our own minds, in our own daydreams, in our own desires, but actually fashioning, creating, building, manufacturing our gods dusting them off, polishing them, right? It's absurd. Why are you protecting your God if he's a God? And this is what the Lord's saying. We're no longer going to trust in our hands. We're no longer going to say, my God, my ruler, trusting in idolatry. They will turn to the Lord. And we find something else that's troubling to the Lord. There's a lot of things the Lord has brought out. But we do find some of the things that are frustrating. They're idolatry. Trusting in something else, 
making their vows to other gods, and trusting in other nations. And this is an important thing for us to remember. Because when the Lord comes to Abraham, what is the fundamental thing he says? I am your shield and defender. What do you think we struggle with as human beings? What do you think we fundamentally doubt? Well, that the Lord's our shield and defender. This is why the Lord starts with the very assertion, I want this to be impressed upon you. I am a God who walks in the midst of my people. I am a God who protects my people. I am a God who continues to lead and shepherd my people. We doubt it. It is not because God is a failure. We doubt it. And so the temptation for Israel was to say, let's look to another nation. Let's look to another king. A king like the other nations. We'll turn to Assyria. Assyria will save us. And the Lord's saying, I I want you to turn away from this. And understand that as I have set you in the land, I am the protector. I am the great shepherd of my people. I am the one who leads my people to life. And so this declaration of not riding on horses, we're not going to trust in uh, our own God that we've made in our own hands. Uh, the riding on horses, we might think, well, is it sinful to ride on horses? I mean, in Montana, among some people, that might just be pure heresy. You know, that might be grounds just to sever a friendship. Is that really what the Lord's saying? Well, you have to understand the implications of a horse. The implication of a horse, we find uh, the Lord giving warning uh, to Israel as they prepare to go into the land, right? So we think of Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. The Lord tells them, don't be afraid of the, the war horses. In other words, you think of the mighty men, and I don't know if I've mentioned here, but I know I've mentioned in other sermons and in other places, uh, the reality of, of where these war horses were, were trained for battle. And, and the horses were selected in such a way that they were eager to go into battle. So uh, a a true horseman who was a competent soldier and a competent warrior would actually have to hold the reins of the horse back to keep the horse from charging into battle. It was clearly a, a competition amongst the horses. And they had to wait for the actual command. So these are intimidating things, okay? These are not... Things where they're slapping the horse, making it run into battle. These are men holding back on the reins, and the horse is staring you down along with the soldier. And the Lord's saying, don't worry about them. (laughs) I mean, here you are on foot amongst these guys mounted on horses. And and so this is another way of saying we're not going to trust in tanks. We're not going to trust in in fighter pilots. We're not going to trust in war planes, right? These sorts of things that would bring into our culture. And so it's not that it's sinful to ride on horses. The implication is we're not going to trust in the foreign militaries. We're not going to trust in what our eyes see. God is bigger than all the nations is the point. God is bigger than all the military forces, no matter how prestigious, no matter how much they may parade their force around. The Lord is still bigger. Notice then in the end of verse 3, the declaration of how Israel identifies themselves. This is a place of lowness. Now in in our day and age, uh, by the grace of God and his providence, there's a lot of ways where orphans can receive assistance. Time of Israel, if you're an orphan or if you're a widow, you're in a very bad place. There's not much that that you you hope that the community has mercy. You hope that the community will provide for you. Uh, You hope that you're given an opportunity, but you're a nobody. And so for Israel to say an orphan finds mercy in you, think about what the Lord has just said. I'm bigger than all the nations, all the war horses, all the mighty trained soldiers, all the men who are skilled with a bow, everything that scares you, I'm bigger than all of it. So here you think of a great king who is busy and occupied, but yet he has time for the lowly, unworthy orphan and has mercy upon the orphan and cares for the orphan who has no father. 
This is where I argue the beginning of Hosea is so important. Two children born under questionable legal birth, if you will, not Hosea's official children, being as he names them. He's basically taking these children without a legitimate father and saying, I'm your father. What a wonderful picture of mercy that's called to our attention here in 14 verse 3. That the Lord is taking an unworthy people who should be so easily cast out and saying, I am your God. I am your father. I confer upon you mercy. Return to me. So there's an, a, a general call, like we hear from Matthew 11:28, 28, that I wanted to do for our assurance of pardon. Christ saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Right? There's, there's a call that's going out there to all, all humanity hearing this. Same with why I wanted to read from 2 Peter. God gives this call, this merciful call, not desiring any to perish. Say, okay, so who's going to respond? Verses 4 through 8, where we look at these verses. We have this declaration of the Lord's wonderful promise. Because Israel's heard the call of the prophet. Israel's not turned. What is the Lord going to do? The Lord knows a fundamental problem that is within us. We don't love God. We, we don't want to submit to God. We don't love his ways. That's not who we are. And so something has to happen. When we think about what has happened in Israel, we think about how the canon of, canons of Dort lays this out. Because it is something that, I still can't fully understand how the Lord gives us call, and yet we find that the Lord is the one who regenerates. I don't know how we fully reconcile those things, but in the mind of God, it's fine. It's, I, I trust that he has it worked out, and I'm not in a position to be above God anyway. Nevertheless, this is what we find in his scripture, and the canons of Dort lays it out. Because we might say, well, what's the purpose of Hosea today? Well, the purpose of Hosea is calling us and reminding us you don't want to push the boundaries of God's grace, right? We might say, well, I'm set in Christ, I'm fine, let me just do what I want, it doesn't really matter. Hosea is saying, don't push the boundaries of what God has set for you. And the canons lays this out, I think, very well, summarizing the fifth head of doctrine. Article 4 gives a warning, we can be handed over to our sin, right? Israel, we want a king like the other nations. God says, fine. Have your king. I told you this won't end well. Take them. See what happens. God gave them over to their sin. Article 5. We can even interrupt the exercise of faith, the canons reminds us. Right? So we can push the boundaries of grace in such a way that we're handed over to our sin in such a way we don't care about God anymore. I mean, what, what a tragedy. What, what a horrible place to be. Going on in Article 6, there's a wonderful reminder that God doesn't leave his people to wander aimlessly. He does not fully withdraw his spirit from us. We're reminded of who he is and his graciousness, of caring for the orphan. Article 7, the assurance, where it says, by his word and spirit, he certainly and effectually renews them to repentance to a sincere and godly sorrow for their sins, that they may seek and obtain remission in the blood of the mediator. What a wonderful statement. And that's what Hosea is laying out here. He's saying to the people of God, I'm teaching my people something, that I am a God who gives life and I take it away. A God who gives true life and takes it away. And he's giving a warning that if we want to push the boundaries of grace, we, we can have a really big issue, can't we? And he's saying, be careful with this. But the assurance is the Lord will not leave his people. That's a wonderful thing. Because notice now how he goes on to speak about the gift of this regenerative work, of this new birth, this new life, the Jew of Israel. Well, if you're in this context of 
Israel, and you can think of Israel being promised to go into the wilderness, right? It's not to say that all Canaan's a wilderness. There's a land flowing with milk and honey. But if you think about Israel going into the wilderness, uh, you think about how do moisture is so important. Isaiah 26, verse 19, as we've made reference to it, is that this promise is a do. It's like new birth. It's new light, Isaiah gives that declaration to Israel. And so that's the metaphor the Lord wants us to understand. The Lord kindles this new life in the power of his spirit, regenerating us, the blossoming like the lily. I mean, we can understand this in Montana. You look out into the mountains in the spring and you see the wildflowers. That's all this simply means that you look out, you, you see that there's life, that we've moved beyond winter. We, we see the life that is evident in the Lord's hand painting the hills is, is what's being called to our attention telling us that you're going to take root uh, like the trees of Lebanon and his shoot spreading out the olive trees the fragrances the point of this is calling to our attention a vibrant forest a place where we would expect to find death and when the Lord gives us new life and heals the apostasy the turning away he confers and gives us new life in such a way that it is so evident. That's the declaration that God is saying. He's saying, I'm going to turn to my people. I'm going to call them to repent. But here's the thing. I understand that humanity does not want God. We naturally hate God and our neighbor. And so it's in the power of the Spirit he cultivates this new life. He's the one who's going to see to it that here's the reality of the life that is ours. And so in verse 8, this is where it makes a lot of sense. Where he turns to Ephraim and says, what am I to do with idols? What, what, what are idols? It's not that God's threatened by other gods. That's, that's the reality of what he's saying here. God, God's not threatened by our, our idolatry. I mean, we've talked about this, where we let our minds wander or the things that are most likely prone to pull us away from our God, right? It's not to say all those things are necessarily inherently sinful. It's just these are things we need to be aware of. They can pull us and tempt us to trust in something other than our God. And this is where the Lord is saying to Ephraim, it's not I'm the top dog and here's all these other gods beneath me. And hey, if they're edifying to you, who cares? That's great. I'm glad they're edifying. Just keep me as a top. The Lord's saying it doesn't work that way. When you look in Israel's history, there's seasons where they're like that. We have God as a top, but we'll also serve the Baals and kind of keep Baal happy in case we need his rain. And, and we don't want storms to destroy our crops, so we'll keep Baal happy, but we'll also trust in God. The Lord's saying it doesn't work that way. I am God. There is no other God. There is nothing else that gives life, nothing else that uh, recreates. And so when the Lord talks about bringing Israel into the wilderness, handing them over to their sin, we also have to remember what Hosea presents there. I'm going to hand you over to your sin. You're going to go into the wilderness. But what does the Lord do? I will woo you. I will talk softly to you. I will bring you back, as he says in chapter 2. And so this reminder here is that the Lord is saying, I will bring you in there, but I'm doing it for a purpose, not just to destroy. And the reality is when we look at God and his ability to smite, it's not hard for God to smite any one of us. It's, it's but a mere millisecond. We can be here and then we can be gone. That's not hard for God. When we look at this, and, and what I want to impress upon us is, A, don't push the boundaries of God's grace. B, take the, the joy of repenting, turning unto the Lord, focusing on Christ, finding the joy in him. But C, also recognizing that in the seasons where the Lord may hand us over to our sin, and as he brings us back, this is the Lord shaping us, molding us. And his providence, when he removes things from us, he's doing this to shape us, to mold us, to bring us into the wilderness. So we have a new priority. It's the Lord remolding us, shaping us to be the people we want. And so Hosea, uh, basically verses 1 through 3 up to this point, yes, there is a call to repent. There is a call to turn unto the Lord. 
And there's also the assurance that the Lord is the one who gives life. Going on then in verse 9, right, argue that this is a continual call for us. And he uses wisdom literature. Basically, it's echoes of, you can find in the Psalms, you can find in Proverbs. And you can sort of see Job, as I would see Job, as sort of an application of wisdom literature of men who are debating about the, the black and whiteness of this age and, and how God works out his justice and his mercy and how Job thinks he's worthy of it. And the counselors think, uh, those who are righteous are those who are always blessed, and those who are evil are those who are always cursed. And they all have to come to grips with the reality that God working in his providence is not that mechanical. And we need to really learn to, to rest in him. And this is where verse 9 becomes encouraging. Whoever is wise, right? What, what is wise? What, what does this mean? When you look in Psalms, look in Proverbs, basically wisdom begins with that fear, that reverence of God, right? You're you're wanting to see yourself as a servant, God is king, and you're wanting the Lord to instruct and and to teach and, and to work in us in the power of his spirit. So he's saying, let them understand these things and let them discern. So discernment is a consciousness of taking what we know of God in seeking to live it out in our lives. So this is basically what Paul says to the church in Ephesians 5, verse 17, where he says, Do not be foolish, but understand, discern what the will of the Lord is. So what Paul is saying is, here are some general rules and and exhortations for you to live by, things we should want to put to death and, and true goals we should have, and the call is that as we live out each day of our life, we, we need to evaluate how we are living before the Lord. Are, are we doing this consistently? Are we not doing this consistently? What needs to be turned from? What needs to be turned to? How do we live this out for the honor and glory of God? And so that's a general declaration. It's really just a call to continually be a disciple of Christ, wanting to learn more and more of the Lord. So we, we know these things. We, we, we continue to, to grow in this wisdom, and hopefully as we're instructing our children, we're building them up in the Lord, encouraging them to live out uh, the gospel. But then Hosea gives us an assurance. Where we might say, well, this is so obvious. We all know this. The ways of the Lord are right. Well, this ways of the Lord are right is uh, the affirmation that as we walk in the Lord, this is truly living, right? This is pursuing him is truly life. And he's stating the assurance of what we doubt, right? Isn't this the very temptation of Eden? Is it really that bad to eat of the tree? I mean, come on, it's just a tree. Is it really something where you want to live under the authority of this God? I mean, really, he's insecure and threatened. Eat of the tree, right? That's what's going on. Here is the exhortation that the ways of the Lord are right. It's a reminder that we walk in this, in the confidence of this. And he says, the upright walk in them, transgressor stumble. So again, it's that, um, that contrast of what's going on. So as we look at this, obviously we, we can look at 14 verse 9 and say, just do it. This is it. This is life. Do it. Deal with it. That's it. But I don't think that's really getting at the heart of Hosea. Because on the one hand, certainly, as we've mentioned, the Lord is warning us against pushing the boundaries of grace. We, we, we don't want to go there. But we have to also understand something else. Who is God? Well, the call is for us to know the Lord, right? Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. So the call to to know the Lord, you find, I believe it occurs nine times in Hosea. And you look at the references, and sometimes it's an exhortation to not just know the regulations of God, but to truly know God, right? I mean, we can lay out all the regulations, we can make a list, and and we can seek to do that list as a to-do list. And you're going to fall flat. You're not going to do very well. 
because you're not knowing the Lord. You need to know who the Lord is, right? And we say, well, what, what does that mean? Well, we've already talked about the prophets. We think of Isaiah 66, verse 2, where we ask, well, who does the Lord look upon? Who can have the assurance of, of God's grace? He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. In other words, it's a teachable person that humbly comes before the Lord, lays her heart open and says, Lord, search me. Show me where I'm falling and where I'm struggling. Conform me to your will. Micah 6, verse 8, Hosea seems to even be quoting him at different times, where Micah says, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? So in other words, again, you hear humbly, not trying to put ourselves above God, not trying to lead God around like the world does with their pagan deities, but wanting the Lord to lead us. So what do we learn from Hosea? Well, I think one thing we've hammered home that's rather obvious is that Hosea's warning us, don't push the boundaries of God's grace. I think that's come through loud and clear. But I think something else that comes through is the Lord knows his people. When we hear these continual exhortations to know the Lord, conform to the Lord, live unto the Lord, die to self, live unto Christ, right? Paul picks up on that. Paul gives those exhortations. Peter, citing Paul, saying some of these things are hard for us to understand, but we're called to wrestle with them. But when we hear these exhortations, the Lord knows us. And one of the things we understand about who we are is we are not a perfect people. And it's important to understand God knows we are not a perfect people. So he doesn't come to a people who are perfect. But he comes to Gomer, the unfaithful one, the rebellious one, the one who, who should be sent away and cast off. And he doesn't cast her off. He comes to the children who have births that are not credible and adopts them. This tells us something magnificent about the plan of God that we can miss so much in Hosea. That he's saying that God's people are not beyond the realm of redemption. He's saying no one is beyond the place of redemption. Think about that. Israel has done stuff that has actually turned my stomach when I've gone through this prophecy. And that's the truth. And the Lord's calling them to repent. They're not beyond redemption. And so when, when somebody says, well, I don't know if God can love me. I don't know if God can redeem me. So often we don't take them to Hosea. Hosea has listed unbashedly some grotesque, immoral things that God's people has done. And here the Lord is calling them to repent, promising to heal them, promising to lead them, promising to be identified with them. And so we have to understand, and why I wanted to read from Galatians 3, just going through, reading different articles again on that tutor or guardian, however it wants to be translated, or pedagogue, it's different translations in the English, but it's the same force of the word. The slave that led the young child, basically at about seven years old, the mother would turn uh, their child over to the slave, and the slave would raise up that child. Now these uh, slaves generally weren't the most competent of slaves always. They had a lot of bitterness. They tended to be older uh, men, and they were very bitter. They weren't always very nice or gracious or charitable to these children. Rather harsh. And when Paul writes to the Galatian church, he's saying, why, why do you want to go back under what we had with Moses? Moses is a pedagogue. He's teaching us something. And, and you don't want to go under that. You want to see yourself as an heir, as a child, as one who has a right to the inheritance because the Father has bestowed his love upon you. 
And so when we look at this in Paul's argument in Galatians 3, and we look at Hosea, Israel teaches us, don't push the boundaries of God's grace. Israel teaches us that after we push the boundaries of God's grace, he'll bring us back, and again, it's warned us. There may be lasting consequences. You don't want those lasting consequences. But the call here is to remember that the Lord comes to an unfaithful people, a people who are prone to wander, a people who are tempted to push the boundaries of God's goodness, a people who are prone to wrestle against him. And he is a God who promises to overpower. And the call is for us as we sojourn under the sun to want to give ourselves over to our God. Where do we set our minds? Where do we set our hopes in this? And where Paul exhorts us, you are an adopted heir with Christ Jesus. Not because you are worthy, but because by the grace of God, he has made you worthy. And the call is for us to live as heirs and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. And we're not doing this in our own strength and in our own power. The very reason we respond to this as we hear from Christ and, and, and as in the gospel of assurance, as canons reminds us, why do we respond? Because the Spirit has been given to us. That now we recognize our unworthiness. We recognize who we are as struggling sinners. We recognize that it's only by taking hold of Christ by faith that we have life. It's only by taking hold of Christ that, that we are made worthy to come into the presence of such a holy God. It is only by taking hold of Christ by faith and walking in the power of the Spirit that we will progressively transform to our heavenly calling and we will ultimately be glorified because our God in his shepherding power is able to save to the uttermost and to redeem the unredeemable and to secure life once for all. And so we might ask then, why doesn't the Lord wipe his people off the face of the earth? Why, why does the Lord promise to heal his people? Because at the exit of Eden, when the Lord utters Genesis 3.15, he promised and vowed to save a people unto himself. When he calls Abram out of his home, he vows and promises to save a people unto himself. And so when we come together and we worship our God, let us be refreshed in the gospel promise. Even as Hosea lays out much of the tragedy of the human condition, he ends with this assurance, this exhortation to walk in the wisdom of the Lord, to want to conform to Christ, to see the power of heaven at work within us in the Holy Spirit, and to recognize we're not a perfect people. And we're not going to arrive at perfection until the end of the age. And our God knows that. And he continues to work on us. Let us then be people who truly desire the Lord to search our hearts, to conform us to his will, to break us of, of the silliness, the, the sinfulness of this age, and to continue to conform us to our heavenly calling as new creatures in Christ. Let us then learn from Hosea. Learn we can never move beyond redemption. We are a people that the Lord's redemption can redeem the unredeemable. And as we have that redemption, let it not move us to a place of let me see what I can do and get away with. But let it move us to a place of praise be to God. I have new life in my Savior. Praise be to God, I am called as a heavenly citizen. Praise be to God that he is the one who conforms me to his will. And may he continue to conform us to his will. And may we desire to walk in his wisdom and his ways as we sojourn under the sun in the power of his spirit. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity 
Please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website, urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.